Our next speaker is Yuri Bilu um, from Bordeaux, who will speak about trinomials, singular moduli, and refor conjecture. So please. Do you hear me well? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, of course, I would prefer to be now in Moscow and mm -hmm. in front of a whiteboard, but we'll have what we have. Well, you are also supposed you should be here. <laughs> yes, yes. I was supposed to be in Moscow in May, but well, let's see. Everything is. Uh, Uh, happens that we want to. Anyway, well, um, uh, I'm not really much in the topic of uh, Alexei's uh, scientific interests, but I think still, uh, well, we would we would find what to discuss in mathematics. And uh, he even invited me. Well, one of uh, I can also have personal memories. Basically, my all uh, last visits to Russia were kind of related to him. First, it was to the uh, summer school that he organized. Then uh, it was also just visit to the HS, uh, HSE, just a research visit. And uh, the last one was also a memorial conference dedicated to his memory, so. Well, okay, let me, uh, and well, he also invited me to, to come to um, uh, Tahiti when he was there, but somehow uh, in the beginning I was not available, and when I was available, it was already too late to visit him there, so. Okay, so I will talk about a uh, recent joint work with uh, two colleagues, Florian Luca from Johannesburg and Amalia Pizarro from uh, Valparaiso, Chile. So here are my co-authors. So you can see the people that I have to deal with. And um, so uh, let me just very quickly introduce the objects we're going to deal. What is a singular modulus is uh, by definition, it's just J invariant of an elliptic curve having a complex multiplication. So if it is given, if this curve is given in the standard Pesh transform, then this is how the J invariant is defined. So it's all very classical from 19th century. And alternatively, a singular modulus is what? Is, uh, uh, J of tau, the tau in the Poincaré plane is a quadratic rationality, that is an imaginary algebraic number of uh, degree two. And J is, uh, well, if you consider it uh, as a function on H, is just a famous analytic function, a J invariant function. And it has this famous, uh, for instance, Fourier expansion with a nice coefficients so that have many interesting properties, but we don't really care about the properties. Actually, in my work, the only fact I use about these coefficients is that they are non-negative real numbers. So, um, and well, these uh, two definitions are of course related. If the elliptic curve E is obtained by quotienting to the complex plane by the lattice generated by tau and one, then the J invariant of this curve is just J of tau. So, so singular modulus is, uh, is this number. So what we know about uh, singular moduli? First of all, they are characterized, they have two important numerical characteristics. First is the discriminant of the singular modulus. We can define it in two equivalent ways. One is more conceptual. So if the curve it has complex multiplication, this means that its endomorphism ring is an imaginary quadratic order and the discriminant of singular modulus is just the discriminant of this order. And we know that imaginary quadratic order is uniquely defined by its discriminant. So if we know that discriminant is delta, then the order is this guy. So let's see. 
It's again standard and classical. Well, perhaps less conceptual, but more uh, convenient for many practical purposes, for calculation paper purposes, is the view discriminant as the discriminant of a polynomial. So this two is an algebraic number of degree two, so it has a minimal polynomial. Note that I write middle coefficient as minus b, not as plus b, just because I want to have plus here. So this is the only reason. And so the discriminant of this polynomial is, is just uh, the, the discriminant of singular modulus. It's easy to see that the two definitions are equivalent. So what we know about discriminant, it's a negative integer congruent to 0, 1, not 4. And every negative integer, its properties, is a discriminant of some singular modulus. So this means that, uh, well, we can ask the following question. If we now have a discriminant, what we can say about singular modulus of this discriminant? And there are two fundamental facts. So this, uh, again, I believe they're known since 19th century. That um, first is that any singular modulus of given discriminant delta is an algebraic integer. Well, already the fact that this algebraic number is a bit uh, surprising because J is a uh, transcendental function. And uh, we take the value of a transcendental function in um, an algebraic point, we obtain an algebraic number. So it's something, uh, something interesting uh, happens and uh, well, uh, but it does, so it is indeed an algebraic number, an algebraic integer, and its degree is equal to the class number of this discriminant. So what the class number, again, Gauss already knew what the class number of the discriminant is. Well, now if it is what's called the fundamental discriminant, the fundamental principal order, then it's just the class number of the corresponding imaginary quadratic field. If it is not the fundamental discriminant, not, not the maximal order, then one can also define class group and class number, which is a bit tricky, but well, well described in literature. So anyway, well, this is the notion of class number, which must be intuitively clear what we mean. And now what we know about all singular moduli of given discriminant, it's, uh, it's crucial that um, they all conjugate over Q and actually form a full Galois orbit over Q. In particular, since they are of degree equal to the class number, they are exactly H of delta singular moduli of given discriminant. Okay, so how this can be illustrated? For instance, we know that there are exactly 13 discriminants of class number one. This famous result, which was basically conjectured already by Gauss and proved by Hegner, Stark, and Baker. And for them, what must be the discriminant? The discriminant must be algebraic integer of degree one, so rational integer. And here is a full list of these guys. Now it's known that there are 29 discriminants of class number two. And so there are 22 pairs of conjugate over Q, singular modulo of degree two. And so on, say 25 discriminants of degree three, so 25 triples of singular moduli of degree three, and so on. And uh, as of now, well, the class number problem was hard at that time, but as of now, it is uh, solved up to class number 100. So we know, due to the work of Watkins, all discriminants of class number up to 100. And this is even programmed in Sage or some other packages. And well, 100 was just some number to stop. Basically, the existing technology allows to go further. But okay, let's, uh, for this talk, let's stop on, on three. Now, what is reinforced conjecture? Before. You're a, sorry, uh, what yeah. is the X in that table? X is what I usually use to denote a singular model. I see. Thanks. Here, you mean here X? Uh, uh, on the next slide, uh, in the table, in your table on the next. Uh, yeah, X is the J uh, is the singular modulus of this discriminant. 
I see. That's the value. For instance, the singular modulus of the scaling at minus three is zero. Yeah. The only one of minus four is 12 cubed, 1728, and so on. I see. So yeah. it's uh, the value of the J invariant. The value of the J invariant at uh, this uh, at this point, delta plus square root of delta over two. Uh, I see, thank you. Or J of two. So X I usually denote, I denote singular moduli using letters X, Y, and so on. Like this. Okay. Now, so what is uh, Riffaut's conjecture? So Riffaut conjectures the following. That if we have a singular modulus of degree at least three, that it cannot be a root of a trinomial with rational coefficients. And well, let us make the following convention. A trinomial in this talk is this guy. So polynomial, we assume it to be monic, and uh, it has three terms. The biggest degree is m, the middle degree is n, and there is a term of degree zero. And we assume that the free term is indeed uh, there, because B is non-zero. We do not formally assume A to be non-zero, but well, if we just uh, eliminate the middle term, we obtain a binomial, so trinomial was equal to zero. This conjecture is really very, very easy to prove. It's just an easy exercise. So the problem becomes interesting uh, when A is a non-zero term, so it, when there's a genuine trinomial. Well, um, one may ask about what motivates this conjecture. Well, as of me, I, I, find it, I find this problem interesting uh, on itself. Well, maybe oh, I should say, well, if the degree is one or two, then clearly it is a root of trinomial, so one should assume h greater. Well, for me, the problem does not really require motivation because uh, while well, we have two very classical objects, singular moduli, known in the time of Gauss, or even Euler, or whatever, and trinomial, which is also interesting uh, classical object, and uh, well, anything about the interconnection seems to be of interest for me. But well, maybe it's not convincing to some other people, so let me give some motivation where how it emerged, this conjecture. And it emerged from the topic about equations with singular moduli. And um, the first, uh, well, result started by the work of Ivan Ray in uh, 1998, who proved the following theorem. Let F be a polynomial, well, uh, irreducible, and um, assume that it is not special in a certain sense, then, uh, this equation, f of x y equal to zero, has at most finitely many solutions in singular mode. So what is special? Special, well, uh, we should exclude some. For instance, we should exclude polynomials of the form uh, x minus alpha, where alpha is a singular modulus, or, well, a uh, scalar multiple. So this polynomial multiplied by some non-zero number. Or a y minus beta. And we should also exclude modular polynomials. What the modular polynomial of level n? Well, uh, it's a polynomial which uh, gives the algebraic dependence between functions j of z and j of nz. So these are two analytic functions of h. They are known to be algebraically dependent. And even this dependence is over q, so we can write it like over z. And we obtain certain polynomial, and clearly, if we have such a polynomial, then if instead of z we put some imaginary quadratic number, then nz is also imaginary quadratic number, and we obtain two singular moduli. And we have infinitely many solutions. Well, this modular polynomial are well unknown objects, but well, I think that the only good thing about them is just that they exist. But well, working with them is not really easy. Well, I just give. The, the first two, well, the, the first one is, is clear, it's just x minus y because we have here j of z and here j of z. The second is already has some rather big coefficients and to, for the third, I think I need the whole slide, so I, I don't need it. And for the fourth, even this slide would not be 
probably sufficient, but well, we know that these polynomials exist and we should exclude them from consideration the theorem of Andre. And when we do it, we obtain this nice result. There are finitely many solutions. And this theorem of Andre was uh, the very first case, uh, non-trivial case of what is not known Andre or conjecture. Since then, there was a big progress in this topic about Andre or conjecture. Many, many results, many further results were obtained. But well, for the purposes of this talk, let us uh, let us assume that uh, uh, well, don't want to know about all these more general results. Just let us let us speak on the theorem of Andre. So. Uh, Andre, as I said, proved it 1998. The same year, another proof was given by Basadix Coffin, but it was nice and conceptual. But uh, it was um, assuming GRH. And uh, there was a big development, well, a famous work by Yafayev, uh, Wimo, Klingler, and so on, uh, where just uh, development of the Coffin approach, of course, with some many other ideas. Another proof based on totally different principles was given by Pila in 2009, who used um, the uh, Pila-Zani approach using uh, uh, functional transcendence and all minimality. But unfortunately, Andres and Pila's proofs were non-effective. They used the ziegel brauer formula. Here, perhaps, I touch a bit to uh, Alexei's uh, research interests. So, um, and, uh, of course, so this made them hopelessly ineffective. And um, the only the first effective proofs were given in uh, 2012 and 13 independently, one in the work of Lars Kuhne, and the other in a joint uh, work uh, myself with uh, David Mas and Alberto Zanio. And um, a year after, Lars Kuhne gave a, a different proof, which I would call very effective, because it could be easily transformed into getting totally explicit results. And this is what was done a few years after. Already in Kuhne's article, he considered just the very first non-special equation, the simplest non-special equation, x plus y equal to one. And he proved that that has no solutions in singular mode. Good. Two years after, in a joint work with Pila Lombert and Amalia Pizarro, we obtained a generalization of this result. We just considered a general linear equation with rational coefficients. Well, we assumed that the coefficients A and B not zero, just to avoid trivialities. And well, which solutions can such an equation have in singular mode? Well, first of all, if our line happens to be a diagonal line, so that means that A plus B and uh, C are zero, so we just have equation X minus Y equal, equal to zero times an equation. Then of course, there are infinitely many solutions and well, all these solutions are just with x equal to y. So this is kind of trivial case. Now, another case, if we take two rational singular moduli, we have seen that there are, exist 13 rational singular moduli. So take two of them, and then through this point, we can draw many, many, many rational straight lines. So this, uh, this case, we have infinitely many. We have, we have uh, many solutions. And also the quadratic case. If we have a singular module of degree two, we have seen again that there are some. And if they happen to generate the same number field over Q, then what we do, we take this point x, y, we take its conjugate over Q and we draw a line. And this line is defined over Q. So we again have a solution. And what we proved, our result is that there are, these are the only solutions. There are no solutions starting from degree three. So this is what we proved. And well, it was the first uh, really very explicit result and not just for a single equation, but for an infinite uh, family of equations actually, two parametric family of equations. 
before generalized our work, he allowed two more variables, m and n. So he considered this kind of equation. And again, m and n are integers, and again, they are unknown. So we have equation in, well, many, many unknown variables. And, uh, well, uh, he proved um, some cases to treat some cases he needed help by Florian Luca, but the main body of his work was done on just on his own. Oh, sorry. He proved that there are only these obvious solutions, but he had to assume uh, x distinct from y. So what he proved that in this case, if we instead of x and y have x to the m, y to the n, we again have, we can do the same picture. In this case, if instead of x and y, we have x to the m, y to the n, we can again draw this line. But in this case, if we have x to the m, y to the n, it's no longer on the diagonal. And if x to the m, x to the n, are, they are not equal. So, so his, uh, this does not extend this uh, trivial case to the equation considered by, uh, by Rifo. And uh, indeed his argument fails for x equal to y. So if you take x equal to y, you obtain equation in just one variable, but he could not do anything about this equation. And this is, uh, this is how the conjecture matched. So determine solutions of this equation equal to with x equal to y is just determining singular moduli, which are also trend. So this is how, how this conjecture was stated, why it was stated. And well, of course, if degree is one or two, then, then we can easily find many trinomials like this. Therefore, conjecture that there are no others, but well, he could not prove it. And uh, well, he considered in his article that we know a lot about trinomials, but well, it's not enough about to, to exclude the possibility that they may vanish at a singular modulus of degree higher than two. Now let's speak on our work. It was in a preprint that appeared in archive in March. And uh, well, our first result is that the false conjecture falls from GRH. If we assume the GRH, then the trinomial defined over Q cannot vanish at a singular modulus of degree at least three. Well, unconditionally, we cannot prove it, but we obtain some partial results. And um, to state uh, our unconditional results, let us, uh, some definition. So we, let's call delta a trinomial discriminant. If its class number is at least three. And uh, there are singular moduli for, uh, there is a singular modulus of discriminant delta, which is the root of a trinomial. And of course, since they are all conjugate over Q, it's equivalent to saying that all singular moduli of this discriminant delta are roots of the same trinomial. So this trinomial discriminant. And um, the first conjecture simply tells us that these discriminants do not exist. So the rest of this talk will be dedicated to a potentially non-existent object. So we will study many properties of this kind of, uh, chimeric object. So first we prove a sort of lower bound. We show that the trinomial discriminant cannot be too small. The next result is that it can be too large either, but we should allow one exception. So we cannot cannot rule out that there is one which is bigger than this huge number. But well, in particular, the set of trinomial discriminants is finite. Sorry, so the exception is explicit no or not? No, no, no. <laughs> it's exception comes from zero zero, so probably it does not exist. Well, probably they do not at all this, yes. <laughs> I see. Yeah, we allow, well, we say that apart from one exception that can be very, very far away, all the others satisfy this input. This is what we prove. 
Now, we also prove that they cannot be just any discriminant. They're very, very special discriminants. They are either of the form minus P or minus PQ, where P and Q are distinct prime numbers. So it cannot be, for instance, product of three prime numbers, or it cannot be, it cannot involve some squares. So particularly, it's always a fundamental discriminant. There is no conductor here involved. And we also prove something about trinomials themselves. So if a trinomial vanishes at such a singular moduli, well, we should assume we should put some lower bound here, which is kind of lazy lower bound. Probably it can be taken away, but we were a bit tired of this project. It was kind of 40 something pages article. So it was easier for us to make, impose this assumption. But if it vanishes at singular moduli of such a discriminant, then um, it's uh, two degrees are very close to each other. So we can have for n, the only possibilities are m minus one or m minus two. But for instance, it cannot be smaller than, than this. So m and n are almost the same. These are our results. So uh, while well, the conjecture is not proved, but well, I think there are some, some work. And um, in the remaining part of the talk, I'll try to give an idea how these theorems were proved. So at least I will speak about the first four. If time permits, I will say a few words about the last. Okay, so all is based on a simple properties, well, basically trivial properties of roots of trinomials, which are the following. Assume that we have three roots with W, X and Y, and just complex trinomial. And well, W is bigger than X, X is bigger than Y. Then Y over X is bounded uh, by something like this. So what the, the moral of this is just, if W is much, much bigger than X, then X and Y must be of very, very close absolute values. So, I put here, so X over W, so my, if W is big, it is a very small number, and we also raise it to the power M minus N. For most applications, even just we don't need this power, it just is enough to just take X over W. But for the very last theorem, well, we would really need this M over M over minus N, so. And, um, well, the proof is, is totally is trivial. So since there are roots of some trinomial, this uh, determinant must vanish. So it has six terms. So, sorry, I have to close the door because there is some, some activity in the house. Okay. So we have uh, the biggest terms are those which involve, of course, W to the biggest power, to N. And uh, they uh, have uh, X to the N with the positive and Y to the N negative, right? And so the two biggest terms in absolute value, they are left-hand side. And this is bounded by the sum of absolute values of the remaining four terms. And of the remaining terms, they're all bounded by W to the N, X to the M. So each of them is either this or small. And the just dividing, we obtain uh, this inequality. But now, well, just triangle inequality tells that this is greater or equal than just the difference of absolute values. And since y over x is uh, smaller than one, we, we finish the course. So it's very, very easy. But well, uh, this, uh, this simple, simple estimate is the basis of everything that follows. Okay, now this was about trinomials. Now what we use about singular moduli? There is some, um, a very explicit description of uh, singular moduli of given discriminant, which basically was uh, follows from what is known as Gauss for theory of reduction of quadratic forms. So we consider the set of triples ABC with the integral uh, coefficients, 
which satisfy well uh, certain conditions. Uh, so first of all, they must be co-prime, and then also must satisfy certain inequalities. Well, uh, so A must be smaller than C, and B must be between zero and A in absolute value. And well, this uh, this condition, well, it looks a bit, uh, a bit not not obvious to digest from the beginning. But well, if you imagine the standard fundamental domain, now this is simply equivalent to saying that uh, this b plus square root of delta over two a belongs to this standard fundamental. And uh, uh, there is a bijection between this set and the singular model of discriminant delta simply to each triple ABC, we associate J evaluated at this number. And in particular, the number of elements in this set T delta is equal to the cluster. And what is crucial here and for many other work about, uh, well, it's uh, effective work about uh, equations in singular moduli is that in the uh, set T delta, there exists exactly one triple with A equal to one, this one. It's given here. And uh, we call this corresponding singular modulus dominant. Why we call it dominant? Well, we'll see because it is, uh, it's very big, why? If we look, look at this, uh, at this uh, expansion, then we see that we have, uh, this is a big term. If, uh, so if imaginary part is not too small, then this is a big number and all this is uh, kind of bound. It's bound away from zero, the imaginary part we said, then uh, this, this will be this will be, well, essentially Q minus one plus something bound. And the same holds true for absolute values. So J of Z is, uh, we should think of J of Z as uh, Q minus one. And now if we take uh, as Z, we take this uh, B plus square root of D over to A, well, then, uh, easy to see that the imaginary part is bounded by some very concrete number. It's actually the smallest imaginary part occurring in the fundamental domain. And uh, this simply means that A is bounded by square root of delta over square root of three. And then the singular modulus, the corresponding singular modulus is what? What is Q minus one is exactly this. Exponent of pi square root of delta divided by A. And so when A is one, when A is one, we have a very big X, like exponent of pi square root of delta. If A is at least two, if A is at least two, then, uh, then we have, a, well, at, at most square root of this guy, so much, much smaller. So let us, uh, let us see a picture. So, here is a dominant, it's very, very big guy. And the others are much, much, much smaller. And this is for just arbitrary discriminant. By the way, note that this dominant must be real because if it is non-real, then there is also its complex conjugate here, but it can be only one, they can be not, cannot be two. So it must be real. It can be real negative. Here on my picture, it is real positive, but it can be real negative, it can be somewhere on the left, but it, it is real. And this is what happens in arbitrary, for arbitrary discriminant. But for trinomial discriminant, when these guys are also roots of trinomial, you remember what we know about trinomials. If there is one big root, then all smaller roots are almost the same in absolute value. So we must have a picture like this, not just chaotically somehow distributed, but very regularly distributed. They're almost like on the circle. So and uh, this is uh, this is what we this is what we use uh, in our analysis. Basically, what we need uh, all knowledge that we need about uh, trinomials is, uh, is is here. So, all 
Okay. Now, uh, we have already seen that these A's in the triples ABC play an uh, important role. So let's give them a name. Let's call them suitable for discriminant delta if, well, if they occur as A in some triple ABC. And uh, well, uh, we obtained some uh, properties and also some recipes for finding the suitable integers. We have already seen that one is always suitable. And we have seen in the previous slide that every suitable is bounded by square root of delta over square root of three. Now also some recipes. For instance, if delta is even and not too small, then we always have either two or four or eight as a suitable integer. So we have a small, very small suitable integer, even discriminant. Next, the crucial property. If we have a prime number, such that the chronicler of delta, so delta is chronicler uh, one, but odd prime simply means that delta is square mod t. And well, again, this prime is not too big, then uh, it must be suitable for delta. And well, this is true also for, for two, so what's Kronecker one for two? It simply means that delta is one but eight. Then two must be suitable for delta, if delta is one but eight. And so this is uh, the co-prime case, but also divisors of delta are often suitable for delta. So if we have a divisor, which is kind of a full divisor, so it takes all the primes that, oh, or that are inside, it takes them completely, so that A and delta over A are co-prime, and A is not too big, then again, it must be suitable for delta. So these are only some recipes. We obtained much more complicated recipes for finding suitable integers for our work, but for the purposes of this talk, this would be enough. Now, this was about suitable integers for arbitrary discriminant. Now, what happens for trinomial discriminants? For trinomial discriminants, the crucial property is that if we have a trinomial discriminant, then it may admit either one or very, very big suitable integers. So we have a suitable for a trinomial discriminant. Then it is, well, almost as big as it can be. We saw that it is square root divided by times some constant. And uh, we see that it must be bigger than square root divided by logarithm. And here is the proof. Well, the proof is not the proof. I would be cheating a bit, but the idea of the proof. So let A be the smallest suitable integer, which is bigger than one. Let A prime be another suitable integer. Well, it's a subtle question why such a prime should exist at all, but well, let us assume that we don't we have it. And let x and x prime be the corresponding singular model. Then they're both non-dominant. So they must be, like in this picture, they must be somewhere here. So they must be almost the same in absolute value. So almost the same in absolute value. But also for them, we have, so what is for x? We have uh, exponent of pi square root divided by a, and here we have exponent of pi square root divided by a prime. But a prime is bigger than a plus one, so it is at most, at most this. But when a is small, then this guy and this guy cannot be very close in absolute value. This guy is actually much bigger than this guy. For instance, here, if a is, for instance, two, then this will be square root of, uh, of domain, and this will be cubic root, so much, much, it's much bigger. And so if A is too small, then they cannot be the same in absolute value, and we obtain a contradiction. Well, the accurate argument, well, not, not so hard, but it required like well, three, four pages of text. Okay, now, Here is the first application. 
Let's prove that uh, trinomial discriminants cannot be too small. How we do it? We just show that uh, we obtain a contradiction with the previous result. We show that uh, every singular modulus like this obtain, uh, uh, admits a very small suitable integer. And so it cannot be, cannot be trinomial. And well, we just don't do the verification for all of them, it would be too long. We just do some sieving. We, for every prime, we sieve out the guys who admit this prime as a suitable and our list empties quite soon. I think the biggest prime we had was like 163 or so, not, or even before, not very big one. And so we simply, we simply just show that in this range, in this range, we cannot have, cannot have a trinomial singular model. In the smaller range, but with class number bigger than three, we simply verify this inequality that we saw it must be must be satisfied and we we'll always find three singular moduli where this inequality is not satisfied. Here we just treat every singular modulus separately, but there are not too many of them, like 10 to, 10 to the five or so. And um, well, for class number three, we have just, well, we have one, uh, dominant and two other which are complex conjugate. And so this inequality is satisfied. So we cannot use this approach. So it was some special treatment. It was probably one of the hardest part of, parts of our article. We needed some orthopedic uh, approach. So I don't want to speak on them. It would require another talk just to tell how we ruled out the class number three. Well, um, and this, of course, we did it with the help of computer using the Paris computer package. And it was just some little computation about 10 minutes together. This is slightly bigger than five minutes. This is slightly smaller than five minutes. This the computer time was negligible. And uh, actually the bottleneck was not the processor time. The bottleneck was memory because when you do sieving, you need to keep uh, big lists and uh, so you need a lot of memory and on laptop, you don't have so much memory. This is why we had to stop on 10 to 11. If we use the supercomputer, we could uh, go further like 10 to 13 perhaps. So. But for further applications, for subsequent applications, 10 to 11 was enough. Okay, now uh, let's speak about the structure. So we prove that uh, trinomial discriminant cannot be just arbitrary. It can be either this form or this form. And again, we do it by showing that in all other cases, there is a small suitable integer. And we saw that trinomial discriminant cannot admit small suitable integers. First of all, it cannot be even because we saw that for even two, four or eight are suitable integers. And well, they're too small to be allowed for trinomial discriminant. Next, for instance, it cannot have more than two distinct prime divisors. So assume uh, the contour. Then this guy must be suitable and uh, while well, it is cubic root of delta. And we saw that uh, for trigonal discriminant, it's square root of uh, log, so it's too small. Well, uh, also for instance, we can show that it cannot be square because if it is minus square, and we saw that there can only, only two primes can be involved, then one of these prime is not involved with it. And for them, for each of these, so for this prime we have a positive Kronecker, and so it must be suitable. So one of the three is suitable and it's too big. It's too small to be suitable of trend or discriminant. Well, and so on. Well, I don't show the, the other steps. They become on each step, the argument becomes more and more sophisticated for the last steps when we ruled out guys like P square Q or so on. It took already some pages, but we ended up with doing this, using this sort of argument. And now 
On the base of this result, we can prove that uh, uh, reinforced conjecture follows from GRH. And this is because uh, GRH gives us uh, small Kronecker residues. And this was, this was very recent work where everything was done very explicitly due to Lamzuri, Li, and Sundarajan. So if uh, we have a primitive real Dirichlet character, then assuming GRH, it admits a prime residue bounded by this very small quantity. And we apply this to chi, which is the Kronecker. It's a primitive real character mod, mod absolute value of delta mod m. And why it's primitive? Because delta is square free, so it's a primitive. And uh, well, we obtain a contradiction if this right hand side is smaller than uh, what we know what is allowed for trinomial discriminants. But this is true only for m bigger than 10 to 21. And this 10 to 21 emerges because of this 10 to the 9 term. This term is okay, but 10 to the 9 is not good. And it's not enough for us. We know that m is bigger to 10 to 11, but not 10 to 21. So we just had to slightly adapt the argument to make some, do some makeup without introducing any substantial new ideas and uh, well, managed to, to prove this. So GRH implies the first conjecture. Okay, now if we no longer, if we do not want to assume GRH, so as I said, then we prove uh, that with at most one exception, with at most one exception, all trinomial discriminants are bounded by this huge number. Well, we apply the previous approach, but now we don't have GRH. What we do have, we have the unconditional result, the Lini Vinogradov. Lini Vinogradov tells that we find a suitable prime bounded by fourth root of m plus epsilon, m to one fourth plus epsilon. And this is good because, well, one force plus epsilon is smaller than one half. So, but not so good news that the implied constant, this constant applied by the Vinograd of notation, which depends on epsilon, it is not effective because uh, why? The proof of this result involves two main ingredients, the estimates for short character sums, verges, which are totally effective, and Ziegler's theorem, lower bound for L function at one, and uh, this is known to be non effective. But well, there is effective Ziegel, there is effective Ziegel, uh, well, poor man's effective Ziegel, which is called the theorem of Tatu Zava, which for given epsilon tells us that we do have this inequality for all M with at most one exception. Well, now there are better numerical values, but we just used the original result of Tatu Zava, the 50s. And uh, using this and doing some, well, again, some, some rather standard analytic number theory, we proved what we need. So with, with at most one exception, we find prime for which delta P the chronicle is one, and this prime is smaller than in this number. And uh, this means that delta is, uh, is not randomly discriminated. This is how we prove, uh, this is how we prove the uh, unconditional upper bound for all but not one. And uh, well, the last result is about, as I said, is about renomials themselves. Do I have uh, a bit more just to, I need this one slide. Do I have time? Yes, of course, Europe, please use okay. the time. Okay. So let's take uh, our trinomial and let us, let us prove that uh, the degrees M and M cannot differ too much. I will show how we prove the inequality M minus N less or equal than four. So what we know, we know that Delta has uh, a big class number, 
as I mentioned, the work of Watkins, who uh, just found all deltas with class number at most 100, and they're all much smaller than 10 to 11. So our delta, if it is a trinomial one, has class number bigger than 100. And we know that a trinomial with the real coefficients can have only at most four real roots. Well, there. And uh, this uh, means that we may find uh, two non-real singular moduli of discriminant delta, call them X and Y, and uh, such that uh, they are distinct and together with their conjugates. So all the four numbers, X, X, X prime, uh, X prime, Y, prime, X dash, Y, Y dash, uh, are all distinct. And uh, let us consider the following number this z, x, x dash minus y, y dash, and there's also difference of the squares of the absolute values. It's an algebraic integer. It is not zero, which is not completely obvious, but easy to prove. And it must be very small because uh, we saw that non uh, Dominant singular modulo, moduli uh, uh, have very, very close absolute values. And actually, well, its absolute value is bounded. Well, let us forget about 0 0.01, essentially m minus n times exponent of m minus n times pi square root of delta. And I include this small, uh, small constant just to take care of some white noise. Now, what, what are their conjugates? What are the conjugates of Z? They again, so things when we apply Gallo action, each of X, X bar, Y, Y bar are singular moduli. So the conjugates of Z will, must be of this form, X1, X2 minus Y1, Y2, where these guys again are distinct singular moduli. And among these conjugates, there is at most, there is exactly four where the dominant guy is involved. So the dominant can be either x1 or x2 or y1 or y2. So for four conjugates, the dominant is involved, and so they are very big. For the other conjugates, dominant is not involved, so they are not big. This gives us an upper bound for the norm. So just take the product of all these conjugates, and we obtain the upper bound for the norm. It's four. Again, I should take care of some white noise. So four times this, and uh, one is very small, so it makes it not so big. And it's a norm of an algebraic integer, so it must be at least one. And uh, this shows that the exponent must be here non-negative, uh, non so this means that m minus n is at most 4.4.02, 4 so it's most four. This is... Uh, how one proves this inequality? Well, um, the hardest part is just dealing with this white noise, this, uh, especially here, it was a bit of, a bit of some work. And um, if we want uh, the better inequality, we need a non-trivial lower bound for the norm, not just one, but something better. And here we need some PEDIC arguments. So we should consider trinomials not only in complex metric, but also in PEDIC metric, and we should do some more. So it was some work on like not, not completely not completely trivial, but one obtains this kind of lower bound, and now we obtain m minus n bounded by two. Well, this is all that I wanted to tell. And this is a picture of my kids who helped me a lot to preparing uh, this talk. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you and your kids very much. Wonderful talk. And uh, so questions, please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Jura, and, uh, uh, I have two questions, uh, a general one and a technical one. A general one, uh, uh, the general one is, uh, 
what uh, uh, do the results like these have any geometric interpretation in terms of modular spaces or whatever it is? Mm. Well, uh, well, you see, it is all uh, in the venue of uh, what is called unlikely intersections. All about this. And, uh, well, uh, of course, uh, you can them uh, in terms of that certain, certain uh, algebraic varieties do not have certain, uh, certain special points and so on. Well, all, all this is about, uh, about unlikely intersections. Uh, well, um, geometric interpretation in terms of, uh, well, Uh, well, if we take it together with the uh, report result about X and Y, so just consider this equation. This is this equation is uh, on the product of two modular uh, lines, and it simply tells that. Uh, this kind of, if, if reinforced conjecture is true, so reinforced proves that, uh, that if we take away the diagonal, then there are only trivial special points for any equation, for any algebraic variety of this kind of the product of two, of x uh, zero of one times x zero of one, or y zero of one times y zero of one. Well, if reinforced conjecture is true, then we don't have to exclude the diagonal. So well, it's all it's all about uh, unlikely intersections. Now, well, uh, you can uh, you can speak whether you are interested in this unlikely intersection business or you are not. So if you are interested, then it's of interest. If you are not, then probably not. I see. Thank you. And the second question uh, is due to my ignorance. So yeah. in many cases, when people try to prove something without using the generalized Riemann hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, they, they prove first that there is only one exception, like yeah. in the tenth discriminant problem and so on. So uh, only one. Sorry. Uh, so uh, why in many questions uh, when you don't use the Riemann hypothesis, uh, you can prove that there is only one exception? Well, this is well in case in all cases I know it comes from Tabuza. From, sorry? Tatuzawa, Tatuzawa. Yeah. Because we have this um, Tatuzawa result. This one. Yeah. Yes, so what is, what is Tatuzawa? So if we impose, we should impose certain conditions. But if we fix epsilon, which is, well, it should not be too big, uh, well, all M, all moduli M, and uh, uh, all, uh, all primitive, primitive real directly characters, then for all of them we have this completely explicit inequality with at most one exception. So this is a strong, very strong, uh, much stronger version of Ziegler's theorem. And why at most one? Sorry? Oh, why at most one? This is this is how well this is how the proof works. You just uh, take, uh, yeah. well the article of Tatu Zava and uh, you will see that he assumes that there are two and he obtains a contradiction. Yeah. He assumes that yeah. if uh, we have two guys uh, with, uh, where this <coughs> is not true, then by making uh, some uh, magic, uh, some Ziegler uh, style, some analytic number theory. Uh, well, very, 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 uh, I would, I would say very intricate, very beautiful analytic number theory, you just get a contradiction uh, when there are two, but you cannot get a contradiction when there are, when there is only one. And that's, uh, uh, even if I allow uh, the very rough sketches of proof, it's it's not easy to explain why why uh, there is a uh, well. Um, I read it recently. Basically, uh, well, my advice is uh, 
take um, Osterman, there was uh, Oster, uh, how it's called this guy, Oster, not Osterman, Osterman, yes, Theodor Osterman. He had an article about uh, his proof of Ziegler's theorem. It was, it's very, very beautiful, very instructive proof of Ziegler's theorem. Take this article, it was like 40 something, uh, maybe even pre-war. And then Tatuzawa basically uh, just developed his approach. So he, you, he, you take, when you have two moduli, then you can also take their product. So we obtain three moduli, then you just play with them. Mm -hmm. Just do some analytic number three and you, you get a contradiction. You, you just see that you cannot, you cannot have two, you, you take product of uh, L of one chi, L of one, uh, say it is M1, M2. So we take L of, uh, L of S chi M1, L of S chi M2, L of S chi M1, M2, and Z of S, product of these four guys. Take their product and um, work with them. And this product has uh, two roots, which are very close to, to one. And then if you work with them, uh, simply using, uh, using some estimates, you show that um, when you have uh, when you have two roots, so then it starts behaving, it starts behaving oddly as a real function, like uh, or just to, just it, uh, it would, uh, well, basically you get a contradiction that uh, you have a function that has positive value at some place, negative value at some other place, but no, no zero in between or whatever. Oh, I see. It is, it's, it's just very, very beautiful uh, analysis. And I don't think that there is easier way to study it than just to, to read Osterman's article and then Tatuzawa's article. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Some more questions? So I would like to ask, so uh, uh, it seems that you, you, in your unconditional parts of your proof, you were not using anything similar to all numerity to pillars methods, right? No, 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 no. no, no. Use anything, um, anything from pillars method, yes. uh -huh. uh, okay. and uh, well, uh, no, no minimality, nothing, uh, nothing, nothing of this. I don't think that we need it. Well, um, I would be happy to to use one so minimality in my life, but so far I wrote the um, surveys articles on this, but not no, not, no, no. no general mathematics. Okay, thank you. And so at the very end, you were obtaining a low bound for the absolute value by using periodic values, yes? Use a periodic number. Yeah, well, this, this is a bit technical. Basically what we do, periodic means the following. The, what's the very end? Remember this inequality about roots of trinomials, this one. We also obtain periodic version of this inequality. Instead of C, we take them in CP. And again, uh, we, argument is the same, but in periodic world, uh, where you have inequalities, you have uh, you actually have equalities. Yeah. So much, much neater in, in the periodic world, so you obtain much more precise results. And it helps us. Mm -hmm. For the main body of the article, we don't use this periodic, but twice, we had to use twice periodic. First, when we had to uh, dispose of uh, this uh, uh, this uh, discriminants with class number three, so complex complex method did not work. Nothing worked in the complex domain, but in periodic domain we managed to do it. But it was it was not it was not real. Is there some Ivasawa theory? No, 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 no Ivasawa. It was totally elementary. It was totally elementary. We did not, uh, we did not use any any big mathematics, but uh, it was uh, just uh, just there. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, fortunately, one of us was Florian Luca, who is uh, who is very good with this kind of things. So he just mm -hmm. he just knew how how to proceed. 
Okay, and also some very vague questions. So would I be right if I would say that the main feature of trinomials, not four-nominals that we use, is this uh, trick with van der Waals determinant? Yeah, we... yeah, but well, actually, actually, there is the same result with arbitrary k-nominals. Ah. That um, at that moment we were not aware, but now I think we will extend some of these results to to arbitrary phenomena. Just well, uh, arbitrary phenomena is just a yes. Polygonal. There is some project. There is some. I will already disclose some secrets, but there is some project to, on uh, extending some of these results to arbitrary like k nominals and it will be only in terms of k the number of uh -huh. monomials but so again the, the issue here is this uh, determinant of three by three matrix because otherwise it is yeah, yeah but yeah. yes yes this gives you this uh, bounded yeah yeah as a dominant of the same value that yeah. okay thank you fantastic talk so some more questions if not the case then let's thank you again Yura. thank you very much thank you very much so the scientific part of the conference is over yeah. and uh, let us think again